is the day. Faithful one, Father, today as we come to your word, please just remind us of that truth. Please plant that deep in our hearts that we would be reminded that you're faithful and that we can trust you when the pain is more than we expected, when, like, when the time doesn't heal things the way we expected it to. Please help us to be reminded today that we can trust you. And lift up the, the families affected by the building collapse right now, God. for your comfort for them, your wisdom for us to know how to be a comfort. We ask for your protection and guidance for the crews doing the work. Please encourage them and give them your strength and give them success to bring people out of the rubble. Amen. Would you be seated? We're going to be in Acts chapter 17 today. My name is David, by the way. Happy 4th of July. So today we're going to be reading through an account of some of the early missionaries in the church. And as we're doing that, think about, you know, so much of the Bible is stories, the true stories, right? They're accounts. It's history, but it's. In, I think it's really interesting that God speaks to us through stories so often. You know, He could have many other places in the Bible. He speaks to us directly. He gives us clear, direct instructions about what it means to follow Him. Right? Jesus, in many places, tells us this is the way you should live your life. Right? He gives us direct instructions. But a lot of Scripture is stories. Why is that? I think part of it is just that in stories, it, it speaks to the things inside of us and to identity and, you know, truths about life in a different way. It, it goes deeper sometimes because when we're reading stories, we, we find ourselves in them. You know, you, you get into the experience of it pretty easily. That's why we go to the movies, right, reading books, because you, you sort of get lost in it. You're like, if I would, you know, you put yourself in the shoes of this person or that person. And so today, as we're, as we're reading, let it be that for you. Let, let's use the stories a little bit as a mirror and reflect on your own heart. We're going to be seeing how three different, three different cities responded to the truth. So as just as we're reading through, think about how do you respond to the truth? Acts chapter 17, verse 1, begins, when the missionaries had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his custom was, 
went in and for three Sabbaths, three weekends, reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. So they came to Thessalonica and stayed for around a month, right? Three Sabbaths. And every Sabbath, Paul was going into the synagogue, reasoning, not arguing, but reasoning with his fellow Jews. Paul was a Jewish rabbi himself, that Jesus is the Messiah who they had been waiting for, right? Think about it. what do they do on a, in a synagogue on Sabbath? They read the Bible. They're studying the scriptures together. And so he's saying, this, the scriptures that you've been studying every week have been pointing you to Jesus. The prophets, Isaiah, Ezekiel, the, the prophecy at the very beginning in, in Genesis that the serpent would bite the heel of the seed who would crush him. He said it all pointed to the Messiah who is Jesus. He had to suffer. That what we saw that we, nobody expected, they, no, many of them didn't think that he was going to suffer. They thought he was just going to come in and bring victory, and he did bring victory. But to crush the serpent's head, he had to be bitten first. He had to suffer. And so he's like, well, he's come. He's here. He's risen. Right? And that's always the message. It, it's important for us to catch that. that that's, that's always the, the thing we should focus on. He didn't get caught up in secondary things. Right? For three weeks... What he was talking about is Jesus died for you because that's what matters. That's the message. Now, it's interesting to consider, too, how did he do that, right? He's going into the synagogues and reasoning with fellow Jews. There's something really encouraging in that to me that he, Paul, as a Jewish rabbi, went and evangelized the way you would think a Jewish rabbi would evangelize, right? He's going and meeting with other Jews and telling them how the Jewish scriptures pointed to the Messiah. He's, I'm making that point because it was very Paul. Like Paul was Paul. God worked through him as he was. Because a lot of times we think that God wants us to evangelize and be Christians according to a mold that doesn't come from God and that doesn't come from scripture, but just comes from Christian culture. We feel like, okay, you know, I should, you know, you guys should evangelize the way that I preach or that, you know, you should evangelize the way you hear this guy on YouTube do it or right. And that we, we feel like we should fit into the mold of what we see others being. And that's not what he asks us to do. God has made you the way you are on purpose. Like your identity is not an accident. He delights in the way that he has made you in his image. He's not asking you to be a different person. He will transform you. He's, given, he's making you a new creation, but that new creation is still you. You're still, Paul didn't cease to be a Jewish rabbi. He continued to evangelize like a, a man who had grown up in that culture. How has he made you to reflect his image? What's the way that you are designed to share his love with the people around you? For me, I, I just got back from visiting my, my cousins in Denmark, my family in Denmark. And for me, a big part of this is I love long conversations about like philosophical things. And my family in Denmark happens to also do that because we're family, so we're similar. You know? So my, my cousin and I talked for like five or six hours in a couple of days about, you know, how can we know what is true and why does God give us these constructs of, you know, give us boundaries of morality? Why does he give us these instructions? That was what was, that was natural for me as a, that's how I am expressing God's love. I'm communicating God's love to the people around me, right? How has he, what's that for you? What's the natural ways to do that? I've found, he's stretched me too in terms of going out and evangelizing on the streets and stuff. It's not, comfortable always for me, but I've found that he's, he's moved me to do that. And when I do that, I still, if I'm sharing with somebody on the street, I'm doing it like me. I'm not trying to imitate somebody else. I ask people if I can pray for them, ask them questions and just let, let God direct the conversations. So just look, for, think about how has he made you ask him how he's designed you and then walk in it. He doesn't ask us to, to make it perfect. 
He, he, doesn't, he doesn't put on you the other person's response. Jesus even told us we don't really need to stress about the details of our words. He said when you called before people to make a defense, he says you don't need to stress about rehearsing it and getting it just right. The Holy Spirit will give you the words. Just speak up. So speak up. In verse 4, we see how the Thessalonians responded to the gospel. It tells us that some of the Jews in the congregation were persuaded. A great multitude of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women joined Paul and Silas. But the Jews who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring the apostles out to the people. But when they didn't find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, those who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. And they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And so when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. What kind of response was this? This is actually a really good response, right? If you think about a great multitude believed. It says of the Jews and the Gentiles and the men and the women, many of them believed that Jesus died for their sins. They trusted in him. They realized he's the Messiah. But many also opposed. And that's actually not necessarily a bad thing. That's, that has been promised to us as well. So what made the difference in those two groups, though? In the, in the believers, probably, they believed. That's what, that's what made the difference for them. They realized, he's right. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus died for my sin. And his sacrifice paid for me. I'm, I trust him. But in the opposition, what does it say? Was it, they didn't, it doesn't tell us that they disagreed that they came to a different conclusion. It says that they became envious. And it's easy for us to pass judgment on that. You know, that we, we like, you know, how ridiculous. You should evaluate it based on what's true or not true. But I think if we're honest, we've been there. Right? Do you know what that feels like when somebody presents you with a truth and you know it's true deep down but because it confronts you or because you're jealous of the position or the, the security or the peace that that person has, you reject it. You reject what they're saying, not because it's true or not true, but because of your feelings about that other person. Right? I mean, so many times, you know, the hypocrisy, we, we have a, an area of hypocrisy and because the person speaking to us does not in that area, because they're being sincere, we get envious of their peace. Or maybe they're comfortable and you're not. And so we, we reject the correction because of envy rather than dealing with, well, is it true or not? James chapter 3, verse 16 warns us that where envy and self-seeking exist, Confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, then gentle, then willing to yield, full of mercy, good fruits, without partiality, and without hypocrisy. We're going to try to glean something from each of the three cities. And here in Thessalonica, notice that envy is opposed to the gospel. He says, where there's envy and self-seeking in our hearts, there is every evil thing. Is there somewhere in your heart where you are envious of someone else? Where you're upset that they have something that you want? It's not to say, this is different from saying, I would, this other person has something nice and I would also like that. That's not wrong in and of itself. But does it bother you that somebody else is comfortable or that they have peace, right? If they have a spouse, or that they have a good job. Is there an area where, you're, where there's envy in your heart and you're allowing it? 
don't buy into the condemnation that tells you that it's too dirty to deal with, that Jesus can't, Jesus doesn't want to know about that, or that you shouldn't confess it to a brother or sister in the church. You need to confess it to a brother or sister in the church. But don't buy the lie that it's a little thing either. He says where that is, there's every evil thing inside of you. Envy is deadly. So what do we do? Because it comes up, right? I think this is one of the easiest areas for us as believers to get stuck. Because there's a lot of things that if you get trapped in it, it shows up, right? If I've got a drinking problem, eventually somebody's probably going to find out, right? If I'm, if I'm sleeping around, eventually somebody's going to find out. But if I've got envy in my heart, nobody's going to see that. It's not on my phone, right? It's not going to slip out. It can stay under the surface for a long time. But if it's there, it's there, and you know it. So how do we deal with it? First John chapter 4, verse 7, tells us, Beloved, let us love each other. Love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God, and he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us. God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, the sacrifice, the payment for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love each other. He tells us to let his love drive us to love each other. And if you think about it, envy a lot of times is fear. That doesn't justify it, but it is that, right? It, on some level, I'm afraid of not having the thing that you have. I feel like I need it and you have it and that makes me upset. So there's, there's a fear in it. And we can combat that by building up that truth in our hearts, reminding ourselves of the truth in our hearts that God loves us and supplies all our needs, right? He's my shepherd. I have all that I need. I, there's no lack. There's nothing I am wanting because not nothing that I desire, but nothing that I'm in need of because he supplies every need. And when I know that, then I'm free. I can be free from envy because I know that whatever I desire he already has it for me. He knows exactly what I need. He's perfectly capable of giving it to me. And he's already shown me that he loves me so I can relax. I can let go of the envy. So where do you need to do that? When we do that, the irony here a little bit is that it'll trigger envy in others. Right? When you're secure, it bothers people. If you're really, if you have peace and joy, it's gonna irritate somebody that you have peace and joy, right? It just does because it'll trigger their envy. And the enemy of our souls, the spiritual enemy, will oppose us. As you, as you walk this out, you'll find that it, you'll meet opposition. And that's not a bad thing. We don't, we don't need to let that discourage us. Be encouraged that if you're facing opposition, you, you set aside the envy, you're, you're trusting God, you're walking in love, and then you face opposition, that opposition is actually a sign that you're making an impact. It's a good thing. That's what happened to them in this city, right? And so after they were opposed, it tells us in verse 10, then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. This one little verse has a lot going on because right, they face opposition and sometimes I think we're confused about what we should do. This gives us an interesting picture of the balance that on the one hand, they took notice of the risks, right? The, in the Proverbs, God tells us the righteous sees danger in the streets and gets out of the way. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with not being reckless. There's a time to choose that something is worth a risk, but there's other times where it's, it's just not, it's not appropriate. 
here in, in Thessalonica, I think they probably re- recognized, you know, if they stayed around, it wasn't going to help the church. It wasn't going to help anybody. At this point, they'd become so notable and so infamous in that town that it would have been counterproductive for them to stay. So they sent them away to Berea. So they took, they were ca- appropriately cautious. But in Berea, they didn't hide They've been chased out of Thessalonica by the synagogue leaders, and they go to Berea into the synagogue. They didn't let fear keep them from obedience. So we see in verse 11 that the Berean synagogue leaders were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, and they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether the things that the missionaries were saying, whether or not it was true. Therefore, many of the Bereans believed, and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men. So in Berea, right, the, the, many believed. And they give us a really good example of how to properly grow and properly you know, adjust our worldview, develop our worldview. Because keep in mind, both in Thessalonica and Berea, these were synagogues, which means they were already worshiping the true Yahweh God, studying the same scriptures that we study, the Old Testament. They didn't have the New Testament, but they were studying the Old Testament, right? The Psalms and Proverbs and Genesis and all that. That's what they were studying too. And so when, these new, when this new information came to them, they, they were ready to grow but wise to check the new information against what they knew was true. So from Berea, from the city of Berea, let's learn to be continually submitting to Scripture. Because it's important for us to recognize like, there's so much new information that's coming our way all the time that it's easy for us to, to start processing it in, in kind of lazy ways or, pro, you know, to start not actually evaluating the information. If you think about when you're listening to music, when you're watching a TV show, if you listen to a podcast, there's a lot of new information and it's shaping your worldview, right? If I'm listening to a song and it's singing about how love is all about the, you know, butterfly feelings I get in my chest, that is a worldview. That is a statement of truth. If I'm listening to a podcast and it's defining for me what it means to be emotionally healthy, that's a worldview. That is an element of truth. And it's not necessarily wrong. There's God will God will use a lot of things in our world to shape, to to shake up and reshape the way we think. And it's not wrong for us to be growing in those areas, but we need to make sure that we keep filtering those things through scripture. Because so often what we do is we we hear it and we just accept it. If it feels right, then we believe it is right. And we should listen to our intuition, but we need to recognize that our intuition is not perfect. So we need to take it and be continually just saturating in scripture so that when, I'm, when I've got this song lyric in my head from some catchy thing on the radio, I'm paying attention to, is that true or is it just catchy? Does that, does that make sense? How do you process new information. Second Timothy verse, chapter 3, verse 16, tells us that all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man or woman of God may be complete thoroughly equipped for every good work. He tells us explicitly that he has given us his word to shape our minds. That's what doctrine is. It's, what, it's understanding what's true. Doctrine is statements of truth. He's given us his word to shape that. He tells us to be saturating in it, to let ourselves, let our lives be shaped by it. And if, you just, if you're not sure about whether or not the Bible is true, if you have doubts about it, that's okay. I'm not at all pushing you to believe anything blindly. On the contrary, please search it out. Even if you believe it, if you're not sure why you believe it, you should search it out. You need to build a foundation for it. If you have questions, you can always email us. The email is pastor at calvarymiamibeach.org. I love the websites alwaysbeready.com 
and gotquestions.org. They're great just resources for if you've got questions. To, right, the, very, the names are really helpful too because they're easy to remember. Um, but they're just really practical tools for understanding the context, historical context, some of the reasons for the science and everything underneath things. But it's important for us to sort this out because it is all or nothing. If the Bible is true, it's true. And if it's not, it's not. And there's not really room for middle ground, right? He says all scripture is inspired by God. It, that's, that's, that's a big claim, right? There's not like, it's not kind of divine or you, know, you get what I'm saying? It's not partly divine. It is or it isn't. Either it is divine or it, it's either trustworthy to guide my life or it's a waste of my time. It's not, there's not a middle ground there. Either Jesus is the way, the truth and the life or he's not. There's not, it doesn't make sense to take that halfway. And so we need to settle it in our hearts because if what we have is just sort of a piecemeal belief and we really are just using the Bible to affirm, you know, using the parts of the Bible we agree with to affirm ourselves and discarding the parts that we, that we don't agree with, then we don't believe the Bible. We believe ourselves and we use the Bible to affirm what we believe, which is not the same. And then when things come our way that test it, we don't have anything firm to stand on. When life gets hard, you need to have a solid foundation because it's going to be tested. Eventually, everything is tested. In verse 13, it tells us that when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was preached by Paul at Berea, they came there also and they stirred up the crowds. So immediately, the brethren sent Paul away to go to the sea, but both Silas and Timothy remained back in Berea. So those who conducted Paul brought him to Athens. Receiving command for Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed, they departed and joined him. And when Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with whoever happened to be there. And eventually, certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, right, secular philosophers, encountered him and said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. They took him to the Areopagus, to the central courtyard, saying, may we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Again, Paul is chased out of town, right? They, he keeps going through these life and death scenarios. We read about it and it's just a couple of lines, but I mean, this is already like the seventh or eighth time Paul's had his life in immediate danger in the last couple of years of his life where he's, you know, been going on these mission trips. He's constantly at the edge of death. This is, that's high stress, right? Think about the cortisol levels and the, you know, the emotional trauma of just Life and death, life and death, life and death. This is hard. This is, a, this, this is a challenging season. But when he gets to Athens, he's surrounded by the idolatry and he's provoked with concern for the people around him. I think concern for the holiness of God, that people would know the true God, and concern for the, the people who are lost. I mean, I know many of us have come from, from backgrounds where we've been in other you know, we've, we've lived our life for things other than Jesus. And you know what that is to be lost, right? Where you're chasing after things that don't satisfy. You think it's going to satisfy. You think the alcohol or the partying or the, the, the job, the money, you think those things are going to give you the acceptance that you crave. You think they're going to give you the peace, but then they don't. And you just feel empty, right? And in Jesus, we've become free from that. You have peace now, have freedom, actually have acceptance, right? A family. And so when we see people who are lost, when we see our family and our friends and right, our neighbors who are still lost, it should provoke us. It's a good thing to be provoked 
against the enemy who is deceiving them and leading them astray, to be provoked for their good. That is a good thing. It's right for us to be provoked for them. But then when we get provoked, what do we do? First Peter chapter three, verse 15 says, in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. And holy doesn't, a lot of times we think holy just means morally pure, but it's, it's different from that. Holy means unique. It literally means set apart. It's unlike everything else. He tells us, in your hearts, honor Jesus as unlike everything else. Right? Our friends and family who are following things other than Jesus don't just have a lesser way. They have a way that leads to death that doesn't satisfy now and ultimately ends in destruction. And a lot of times we forget that. It's really easy for us. I mean, I've been convicted about that recently. It just, it's so easy to to think of it like we just have a better way. We have the way. Everything else is no way. It's leading to destruction. You need to, you need to in your heart, settle that. Remind yourself today that he is God alone. He's the only one who paid for your sin, who paid for your family's sin, who paid for your friend's sin. And they don't know him. So in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Be ready to tell them. But do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you're slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. Be ready to talk to them and live a life that honors him in front of them. We shouldn't be aggressive, argumentative in the way we present the gospel. We need to have a good conscience so that when I tell my kids about Jesus, they're not thinking of the time I cursed them out two days ago, right? That you're not, you didn't scream at your mom, scream at your sister, scream at your cousin a week ago. Now you're telling them about Jesus' love, right? I mean, we're going to make mistakes, but have a good conscience before them. Live a life so that every moment of your life is a testimony of the goodness of God to them with gentleness and respect so that when they have something to say, their own hearts convict them that it's not true, that you really are an ambassador of his love in their life. Next week, we're going to dig into the message Paul gave, but let's shift now and take a look at the third city, right? Athens, what was happening there? Verse 21 told us the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent all their time in nothing but to tell or hear something new. And after Paul had shared the gospel with them, it tells us in verse 32 that when they heard of the resurrection from the dead, some mocked, others said, we'll hear you again on this matter. So Paul just left. Paul departed from among them. But some joined them and believed, among them Dionysus, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. And Athens has been held up for us for a long time as sort of a picture of academic discussion and reason, philosophy, right? This is the city of Plato and Aristotle. It's the, you know, it's the philosopher's city in many ways, the academic city. It's such a picture of those things for us. And that's true. But I think it also highlights for us the danger that we can have sometimes when we get in all these discussions. There's, and it, it highlights for us the principle that, that we're taught that there is a time to avoid foolish disputes. I've been, this is an, one that traps me a lot. I like discussing things. Like I said, I liked talking with my cousins about philosophy for hours. There's a place for that. But there's a time where it, where it becomes counterproductive. It becomes fruitless. Titus chapter 3, verse 9 through 11 warns us to avoid foolish disputes. Arguments about genealogies, secondary issues in the scriptures, right? Contentions and strivings about the law because they are unprofitable and useless. Reject a divisive man. After the first and the second admonition, right, warn him twice, hey, your arguments, these things that you're bringing up that are destructive are, are secondary. They're, not, they're, they're a waste of time. After two times, reject him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. 
in Athens, there were a lot of people, it seems, who had this kind of detached intellectualism that kept them from engaging with the true God. They didn't engage with the truth because they were discussing so much. We run into this sometimes when we're, if you're sharing, the, if you're going out evangelizing, run into this a lot where you're trying to have a productive conversation with one person and somebody else comes up and they want to have a conversation and it, it's just nothing. It's, a, it's about nothing. And I think there's a good warning here for us that we don't need to, to just endlessly discuss nonsense. There, we have permission from God to avoid foolish disputes. He tells us to. There's, there comes a time where it's not necessary. It doesn't mean we don't engage with people and we need to be slow to pass judgment, but he does tell us there is a time to move on. So I'll, you know, we've already laid out the gospel. You've already told them everything that you need to tell them, and now we're just going in circles. We'll talk next week, but I need to focus on this other person, right? Sometimes you just have to do that, and that's appropriate. Now, the other side of this issue as the band's making their way back into the sanctuary, the other side of this issue that we need to be careful of is our own hearts. It's easy for us to say, okay, that was irritating. And we, you know, I'm not going to talk for 45 minutes with you about how many angels can dance on the pin of a needle, right? But we do this too, where there's something that God's convicting me about and I don't want to deal with it. So I'm going to just come up with a you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at all the angles of it and find as many angles to this issue as I can so I don't have to deal with the fact that I've been getting drunk every night for the last six weeks, right? Because I can, well, Jesus turned water into wine, so he's okay with alcohol. And Jesus drank, so I can drink. And never mind the fact that I'm drinking till I black out, right? And we, we avoid the issue by coming up with these arguments of, well, is it, did he really mean that, you know? I'm just having a good time with my girlfriend, boyfriend, right? That it's, it's not, you know, did, it, they were dealing with, like, one of the arguments that comes up a lot is, you know, when, when the Bible talks about homosexuality, that it was just referring to the, the child abuse of pedagogy that was common in Athens at the time. And so that's what Paul meant. That's not all, that's not what it actually meant. He's very clear. But we come up with our arguments to dance around the issue so we don't have to settle on it. Is there an area where you're doing that? Where you know what you're supposed to do. You know there are things that are out of order, but you're not, not ready to submit your heart. One of my favorite artists, one of my favorite songs has this line about the idea that we can deconstruct the light so that none gets let in. Listen to the podcasts, and I read the book, and I read the other book, and I look up the Greek and the historical context, but I won't do it. Right? Is there somewhere where you just need to step out in obedience? Again, he's, he's not afraid of your questions. He wants to engage with you. And if you're struggling, he's eager to help. He says the, the, the smoking wick, you know, the, the candle that's about to go out, he doesn't put out. The branch that's hanging off the vine that's ready to fall and die, he's not going to break you off until the very end. He desires to bind you back in, to heal you up, to light that fire again. But you need to decide what you're going to do. You need to decide whether or not you're going to engage with him, get vulnerable with him. Whether there's an area of sin or discouragement or confusion that you're wrestling with right now, again, I want to encourage you, just get vulnerable with God this week. Just decide to... to be honest. Read your Bible and ask him to teach you. Ask him to speak to you through his word. He promises that he will. Talk to people if you need to talk to people. Would you stand? We're going to close in worship. Before, but as we, as we do that, as we're worshiping, I encourage you just reflect and 
talk to him about how has he designed you? What's the way that he's designed you to share his love with the people around you? What are the opportunities, the relationships, the, the re- relational dynamics that are natural for you to be telling people about him? Where are you prone to envy or hypocrisy? Where do you need to submit to his word to come into agreement with him? Or do you need to go back to just reading your Bible? Do you not really know what he says yet? And is there somewhere that you've been trying to hide, trying to distance yourself, detach from the truth, where you know what you're supposed to do, but you're just going in circles around it instead of doing it? Yeah.